Behind these dreams there is passion, research and creativity. The Dentaid Research Center gives meaning to the goal of improving people's oral health and brings us closer to our founder's dream for all people to have good oral health forever. Research allows us to understand the science behind oral health and disease and the mechanisms that cause the latter. Only this way can we find the best solutions and apply the care needed at every stage of life. We generate new knowledge to respond to new health challenges. We study real 3D images that reveal the three-dimensional structure of biofilm to observe any changes along the surface and the contact areas. In our laboratory studies, we simulate real conditions of the mouth in artificial mouth models that mimic the changes that occur naturally. Thanks to the studies we carry out at the Dentaid Research Center, we can answer questions like Do we all have the same oral microbiota throughout life? Can we predict diseases and health alterations? Research allows us to discover more effective active substances. And most importantly, to know the best way to administer these. We work rigorously so that all people get the solution they need. We have developed toothbrushes and interproximal brushes capable of meeting the needs of different people with different conditions. We turn concepts into reality in line with quality regulations and scientific evidence by conducting internal studies and joint collaborations with prestigious universities. Through innovation, we manage to develop new solutions that improve our quality of life and our health. Dentaid Research Center. Passion for improving people's oral health. Welcome to Aula Dentai. Today, we are going to talk about the role the oral cavity plays one year after the start of the COVID-19 pandemic with our guest, Professor Adolfo Contreras. Dr. Contreras is dentist, master in medical microbiology and doctor in craniofacial biology. He's a tenured professor at the School of Dentistry of the Health Faculty at the Universidad del Valle in Cali, Colombia, and director of the Periodontal Medicine Group at the same institution, as well as being the author of articles on the topics of periodontal microbiology and periodontal medicine. Good evening, Adolfo. Thank you so much. Good evening also, Vanessa. And um, I would like also to introduce you. Did you allow me? Yes, please. OK. So Vanessa Blanc is a biologist, and she is a doctor in microbiology. She's a researcher at the Denta AIDS Research Center, and she's responsible for the Translational Science and Development Department at Denta AIDS, and she's well being the author of articles on the topic of periodontal microbiology. And this is my pleasure to share with this academic session with you. Thank you, Adolfo. Thanks for your kind introduction. So how have you been this past year? Actually, I can say that we are probably doing fine. But to tell the truth that this year of the pandemic that has passed, our life has changed a lot. And we have been trying to adapt to uh, this new state of affairs. Yes, you're right. The arrival of SARS-CoV-2 took us by surprise and has disrupted our entire way of life. So do you think that the situation could be foreseen? Or in other words, was there any indication that something like this could happen? Vanessa, the truth is that there were uh, some indications. In the last 17 years, and that is in 2002, and 2002 and 2019, there were two important outbreaks caused by two new coronavirus, of which there were no previous reports. So you're referring to the outbreaks caused by SARS-CoV-1 in 2002 and 2004 and later MERS in 2012. And in fact, in the last 20 years, we have endured three epidemics caused by three different coronaviruses. And we must also mention the cases of swine flu that also affected humans in 2009 and 10, and which was feared to spread worldwide. Yeah, exactly. And as it has been pointed out, 
that these viruses were from animal origin and they were passed on to man. And this phenomenon is called zoonosis and basically corresponds to the transfer of pathogen from animals to humans and vice versa. Some human practices, Vanessa, are related to these risks, such as the contact between humans and species in the natural environment, and also the urbanization of wild species, such as the commercialization in the market of the various wild animals that can carry these pathogens. This is something that has happened throughout humanity. As, as we can see here in this figure, this can be parasites, fungi, bacteria, and viruses. And in this uh, viral zoonosis graph, we will see a list of well-known diseases caused by zoonosis that can be as handsome as rabies, others as lethal as the Ebola virus that by fortune has been controlled, some caused by viruses that use mosquitoes as a vector, such as the case of the chikungunya, dengue, and Zika fever, and hantavirus that are endemic in the south of Chile and Argentina. And we also have the severe acute respiratory syndrome of, or SARS that we have been hearing about for recently and where Vanessa will remind us of some aspects of their viral bi biology. Yes, in the case of coronaviruses, they belong to coronaviridae family, which is divided in two four large groups, the alpha, the beta coronavirus, delta and gamma coronaviruses. The gamma and delta coronaviruses show susceptibility to birth and fish, causing serious damage in poultry and livestock. And the alpha and beta coronaviruses are the ones that can infect mammals. They have a long history of emergence and reinfection in both animals and humans, causing diseases ranging from a common cold to more serious diseases like bronchiolitis, bronchitis, pneumonia, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, among others. And if we look at the alpha and beta coronaviruses branches in more detail, we can see the green arrows that indicate the four coronaviruses that infect humans, and the red arrows locate the MERS. The right image shows the probable way of transmission of SARS-CoV-1 and MERS from bats to humans. But for SARS-CoV-2, it's still necessary to study whether this was a direct transmission from a bat or is it passed through an intermediary, such as, for example, a pangolin. Probably, if humankind wants to reduce viral transmission events between species, more research must uh, be done on the characterization of this type of virus and protocols for working with farm animals and the handling of exotic animals that must be carefully reviewed. And we must stop invading the habitats that used to be forests and jungles. But from an epidemiological standpoint, what is the current status of the pandemic we are enduring, Adolfo? In this slide, Vanessa, uh, we have four diseases that are, are, are sort of uh, prevalent as influenza, COVID-19, SARS, and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And we are going to compare the r naught or the basic reproductive number, the fatality rate, the rate of hospitalization, because this is important to uh, the health system, and the attack rates on top into the population. Then, to recognize those viruses, uh, the most infectious is SARS. The more lethal is middle is respiratory syndrome. And the most prevalent, influenza that is affecting 1 billion people a year. But however, the most challenging to the health system and to the mankind 
is the actual one, well, the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. As we can see in the next slide, and actually I do recommend you to review this resource from the John Hopkins University that they present every day, yeah, they actually update this map, a global map on how the pandemic is progressing in the world. And we can observe in red the global cases and the countries with greater number of cases. Also, we can observe the, the global mortality and some countries that have managed to stop the advance with the strict quarantines and it is worth to highlight in America, the case of Uruguay, and in Oceania, the cases of Australia and New Zealand, that being relatively isolated areas, they have managed to control the arrival of new cases. It is interesting also that countries such as Vietnam has only presented 1,000 cases. 100,000 cases, while Colombia and Spain, which about half of the population of Vietnam, yeah, we have uh, around 50 million people, we are presenting actually 2.3 and 3 million of cases respectively. And we are among of the 10 countries most affected. So in spite of all the public measures, this epidemic is still expanding. And there is an increase of cases in Chile and in Italy and in France. And Adolfo, how is this virus transmitted throughout the population? Vanessa, I was determined early on that this virus is transmitted through the air. When people read, whistle, speak or sing a large numbers of particles are generated that can reach different distances. If the person is infected, these particles can carry the virus. And even more so, if the person coughs or sneezes, in these cases, it has been observed that these particles, depending on their size, can be dispersed over a distance of two to eight meters. So from what you mentioned, then this virus is present in the mouth and in the upper respiratory tract, that's the nose, the nasal cavity, mouth, throat, and larynx. Yes. Very early during the pandemic, it was observed that SARS-CoV-2 entered the cell and then it is able to replicate thanks to an enzyme that is attached to the cell surfaces. This is called the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. This enzyme plays a fundamental role as a regulator of cardiovascular and renal pressure. It is found distributed in practically all the organs of the body, the intestine, the bladder, the heart, and the kidney express the enzyme that is the receptor to the spike viral protein as you can see in the right side of the, of the slide, in panel B. In panel C, there is a differential expression of this receptor at the bare oral sites. And in the, in the bottom of this slide, in panel C, and in green color, actually this is a confocal microscopy image, you can see the expression of this receptor at the dorsum of the tongue and in panel F in the oral uh, mucosa. So, as the mouth and the nasal pharynx and the throat converge the respiratory and digestive system, this is actually a problem. In this way, actions such as breathing, talking, and other such as coughing and sneezing produce droplets of saliva and vapors in the breath that can be containing the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this is how this virus is spread into the population. That droplets have different sizes and the burden of this size 
they either fall and deposit on the surfaces, on clothes, hands, and they contaminate them, or they remain suspended into the aerosols, and then they infect those who breathe them in. This is why we are using masks uh, to um, uh, cause this infection. And also, uh, there are uh, another ways to get infected. One important probably is the mucosa of the ola, or ocular uh, conjunctiva. This is probably another important route of infection. And other uh, less important routes, but also uh, um, uh, important, uh, can be the fecal and oral contamination, having sexual intercourse without protection, breast breathing, and um, eating uh, tainted food uh, uh, or gathering uh, and, uh, uh, social gathering. So this could be the reason why this virus can be found in the oral cavity. And is it possible to find the virus in saliva throughout the time a person has symptoms? Has it shown in this graphic, in this uh, Lancet article, uh, Vanessa? The viral load in saliva, that actually are the blue dots, is very high even in the early stages of infection. And the general behavior of, of this uh, viral load is to decrease as the patient improves. And here there is an important point that I would like to remark. Infected individuals have a high viral load in the upper tract, and it is estimated that during the incubation period of the virus, before presenting any symptoms, these individuals seem to be highly infected, and thus would help to explain the rapid spread of this virus that is becoming pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, what you have mentioned differs from that described for the infection caused by SARS-CoV-1 and MERS, since these two viruses presented a strong tropism for the lower respiratory tract, and patients presented a higher viral load between 6 and 11 days after presenting symptoms. So, perhaps this difference is one of the reasons these viruses do not spread the same way as SARS-CoV-2 has. And Considering this presence of the virus in the mouth and that it's likely that there are many people who have the virus and are not aware of it, what is the real situation in dental practice? Vanessa, this video shows how aerosols are, are produced. And I have to give the credit to uh, Professor Julian Balan. Um, many of the common practices in dentistry produces aerosols. And in this case, uh, I'm using a model. Uh, the doctor is grinding a tooth to do a clown. And we add fluorescein to the water reservoir in the unit. And what we are just watching there is the heavy drops that we can see even with the naked eye. Of course, the dentist is using the PPI and very strict protocols to protect ourselves. But considering that the virus can survive on surfaces up to 24 hours, and in the air, we do not always know that there is a latent risk. For this reason, I would like in this space to share with you the results of a recent publication that we did in, the, in our temple school. And um, we try to characterize it with different type of aerosol particles that are generated during the practice of dentistry. And using this device that is called a laser beam refraction, and we use three systems to mitigate the aerosols, and where the use of rubber band and highly efficient suction were effective to minimize large and intermediate aerosol particles. And we are also thinking to add some chemical agents to the water lines and to the time reservoir in the dental units to increase the capacity to neutralize this virus. Thus, the measures that I will, would like to deliver is not to stop doing dentistry 
as the case in need us. The message is to improve resources and to cope aerosol with technology and prevention. So, as various health authorities have pointed out, it's recommended that before a patient is treated in the dental office, he or she rinses with an element that can lower the viral load in the mouth, thereby reducing the likelihood that these aerosols carry the virus. But if this is recommended for dental clinics, why not daily use? This could be an important mitigation measure since lowering the viral load in saliva in infected individuals, they could spread the virus less. Therefore, besides the prevention measure recommended from the beginning, that is maintaining a safe distance, wearing mask, washing, hand washing, we should add maintaining good oral hygiene by using mouthwashes and toothpaste that contain active ingredients that inactivate the virus. As you have mentioned, Adolfo, the main source of the spread is the nose and the mouth. And in other words, washing our mouth should be as or more important than washing our hands. I love that last statement, Vanessa. And um, let me ask you uh, this question. Uh, do we have substances in the mouthwashes and in the toothpastes that actually can inactivate this uh, deadly virus? Well, uh, if we analyze the literature prior to the pandemic, we find an article published by Popkin et al. in Popkin and colleagues in 2017. Uh, these researchers worked with uh, an influenza virus. It's a virus that has a lipid envelope very similar to the coronavirus envelope, and observed that CPC. This is the, the, influen the flu, the influenza virus. And this virus was treated with CPC at very low concentrations. <coughs> and they demonstrate that this CPC is capable of breaking this envelope, the envelope of the virus, inactivating the virus. Furthermore, Chen and colleagues uh, in 2019 carried out a study where they tested an, the antiviral capacity of some 2,000 drugs and 36 of that drugs were tested against four coronaviruses, including the MERS. And that they observed that cetylpyridinium chloride was the near best compound for inactivating these four coronaviruses. So with this in mind, let's take a look at this representation of coronavirus. The spike protein is drawn in pink and its lipid membrane in red, which, as with the influenza virus, has been suggested to be able to be degraded by CPC and the boy inactivating the virus, the virus. And in this image, we can see that other molecules like chloroxidine or povidone iodide uh, that are contained in most washes might also carry out a similar action. Well, currently, there are at least one year later, there are at least six publications that demonstrate in vitro the action of some components of mouthwashes on SARS CoV 2. I will present a table from one of the latest papers that allows us to summarize the results of all other studies. Camin and colleagues uh, used it, they studied. 10 different formulations, six with deep CPC, two with CPC plus chloroxidine, one with chloroxidine, and the last one with delmopinol. It's an uh, aminated alcohol. What we can highlight? Well, that the formula that contains C only, only contains CPC, reduces the viral load by only by uh, 40%, and that is 0.2 orders of magnitude. However, all the CPC containing formulas reduce the viral load by up to 99.99% over four orders of magnitude. And this is observed in all studies currently being conducted in vitro, indicating that CPC has a high anti SARS CoV 2 activity. So, um, going one step further, Adolfo, are there studies in patients analyzing the effect of some of these molecules on SARS-CoV-2? That's a very important uh, question. And of course, there is less evidence published and in vivo than at the in vitro studies. And in, on that regard, 
I would like to refer to first randomized clinical trial published by Muth in 2017. Of course, this is just before the SARS CoV 2 epidemic appeared. But, but uh, the authors, uh, they were using a uh, sepilpidibidin chloride and they spray that intraorally uh, for 75 days. And they try to demonstrate a reduction in the frequency of the upper respiratory infection among 100 subjects. The subjects were split into two groups. 94 subjects finished the trial and six uh, presented upper respiratory infection in the control group, while only two uh, were presenting this kind of infection in the test group. But um, what, what I would like to highlight in this, uh, in this clinical file is that the patients that use the, that product, CPC, presented less symptoms like cough, sore throat, and also presented a more rapid disease resolution. Next one. See, this is basically um, the first uh, in vivo uh, direct evidence on lowering salivary viral load after the use of an oral risk containing, in this case, chlorexidine in touch subjects that were uh, positive for COVID-19. Uh, actually, they took the samples at diverse times after their hospitalization. And in general, I can say that there is a decrease in the viral load after one hour use, and it is maintained for two hours. And later, at four hours, the salivary load, uh, viral load goes up again, which reveals that the virus is possibly replicating at the salivary glands and also in the uh, epithelium of, of the mouth. Actually, this is a, a study uh, published um, by Lucia Martinez Lamas. And actually, um, these authors use a mouthwash containing iodine, and they measure the viral load of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, that was determined in uh, four patients using saliva samples at different times, five minutes, one, two, and three hours after the use of mouthwash. And there is an evident decrease in the viral load after one hour and two hours. And there is some uh, viral recovery after three hours. And at the bottom of this slide, uh, Vanessa, um, I would like to highlight also uh, this review done by Morton. Uh, this is the Cochrane Data Gas Systematic Review uh, Group, because they were uh, very concerned uh, about the health workers that are getting infected when they're treating the patients with uh, positive for COVID-19. And uh, in this uh, systematic review published in September 2020, they find actually uh, nothing uh, to protect the health workers and uh, to protect the, uh, the people. And um, next one. And actually, this is the only randomized clinical trial that has been published so far. And um, it, it was uh, done in Singapore, and the doctor is Dr. Uh, Chaminda uh, Sevilla. Uh, they basically um, randomized 16 patients to four groups, and the products that they were using they were uh, betadine, that is uh, povidine, uh, povidone, uh, iodine, chlorexidine, uh, CPC and has a control, they use uh, distilled water as placebo. And as you can see in the panel of the, of the white, actually uh, the CPC uh, was the product that uh, uh, was uh, performing better uh, to uh, reduce uh, this viral load. And um, with that, I would like to introduce our pilot uh, um, uh, randomized clinical trial. And actually, um, we are uh, partners, you know, Dentaid and the University of El Valle. We are partners in this, uh, in this uh, important stuff. The aim of this uh, pilot, uh, randomized double band and placebo controlled clinical trial, was to evaluate 
the capacity of a mouthwash to reduce SARS-CoV-2 viral load in saliva in COVID that were previously diagnosed um, uh, um, with the virus. Next one. This is basically um, uh, a picture of how we uh, do the uh, detection. Basically, we are using the, the CDC uh, panel for detection of this uh, coronavirus. And we are using RT-PCR for um, determining um, the viral nucleocapsidin detection. 23, 23, uh, 23 uh, symptomatic of group of uh, patients were selected and randomized into two groups. Both groups uh, rinse or gargle with one minute with either distilled water, you know, that was the placebo group, or with the product. The product actually contains uh, CPC and chlorhexidine. And saliva samples were taken before the use of placebo or more wash and at 15 minutes and one hour and two hours after the use of the mouthwash. Then go to the next. Yeah. In the figure one, um, we can see the relative proportions of individual viral loads versus baseline in both groups of patients. So we can observe here that the number of patients who has a decrease in the viral load was significantly greater in the group that used the most drugs than in the placebo group. These results, Vanessa, are very promising. Since they managed to reduce the viral load in the third group in eight out of 12 patients. While the same phenomenon was only observed in three patients in the control group. And this topic is at least very interesting and that allows us to show the next four slides. So um, you can see here um, the randomized clinical trials that are trying to answer the, the, uh, 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 the same question. And they're, they're, they're trying to uh, explain if uh, there is a reduction in the viral load in saliva um, um, after using mouth, mouth washing. And uh, they, 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 they try to verify the, the data, data hypothesis. And um, probably the, we can also interfere with the clinical cause of COVID-19. In the next study, um, the study with most participants has 40, 80 subjects. And the products that are using is uh, hydrogen peroxide, iodine, chlorhexidine, alcohol, plus essential, uh, essential oils, iodine, and CPC. And we can go uh, to the next. Vanessa, and also to the next. And um, as, as, as summarizing, uh, we hope that we will have a clear answer after these um, randomized clinical trials um, uh, will produce the results. And because um, um, using mouthwash uh, that can have a public health implication and are very, uh, very easy, applicable to, to the population. Also, Vanessa, there is an apparent um, connection between the oral cavity and COVID-19. And here there is a recent evidence that shows that SARS-CoV-2 seems to interfere with the, with the microbiota of the host. Also, bacteria and viruses can establish a synergistic relationship and were untreated periodontitis and via translocation of pathogenic microorganisms from the mouth to the lungs may cause pneumonia. Uh, actually, uh, the researcher um, more recognized for that was uh, Frank Escanapi. And SARS can also be found in gingival Trebicular fluid and also into the periodontal pockets. 
And this is a very recent study in vitro that has been shown that an oral orange complex pathogen such as Fusobacterium nucleatum increases the expression of the protein AC2 in respiratory cells, and in that way, the infection of cells can be increased. There is also new evidence of the relationship between periodontitis and the severity of SARS-CoV-2, such as the case of this control, case control study. Actually, the um, um, uh, first author is, uh, is uh, Dr. Nadia Maru, and they are from Qatar. And uh, one of the authors is also uh, a colleague uh, Professor Mariano Sanz from the uh, Complutense University. And what um, this study uh, found uh, that a worse periodontal condition was present in forty subjects that had all type of COVID complication. And after adjusted of ratios, um, um, Mm, for in 14 cases, the, the patient died uh, for an adjusted ratio of 8.8. And people that were recruiting admission to an intensive unit care, there were 30 cases of that. The adjusted uh, ratio was 3.5. Or the patient that needed assistant ventilation, there were 20 cases, and the ratio was 4.5. 4, 4 of course, this is just a preliminary study that needs further confirmation, but is a very promising one. But Adolfo, we currently already have vaccines, and there are countries that are undergoing an intense vaccination process. Let me show you this table that it's a summary of the main vaccines that uh, we are using uh, now. Here you can see the list. The first two, the Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna, are based on the use of messenger RNA molecule in which it is, is, is encapsulated in a lipid envelope so that it can enter to the cell. And once inside, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein will be synthesized from this mRNA some of these proteins will travel throughout the surface of the cells and will be recognized by the immune system. This way, the immune system will recognize this protein as foreign and will generate defenses against it. Then, when the individual comes into contact with the virus, the immune system will be ready to quickly attack the virus, preventing the infection. Other pharmaceutical companies have developed a virus inactivation strategy. In this case, the virus can be inactivated by heat, radiation, or chemical products. And that is the case of Sinovac. They use a beta propionolactone, which prevents the virus from replicating. However, its protein remains intact. And in the case of viral vectors, Genetically modified adenoviruses encoding SARS-CoV-2 spike protein gene have been used, and these adenoviruses can infect cells but cannot replicate in them. And this way, the spike protein gene is expressed, and the same thing happens as explained for the Pfizer vaccine. Of all the, the vaccines uh, viable so far, only Janssen is a single dose. All other are two doses. The interesting thing about these vaccines is that they are all reported to protect mainly against severe cases of the disease, some up to 100%. However, if we don't know if there are, if there may be a significant group of vaccinated people who are infected anyway, who don't develop the disease because the vaccine protects them, but they can transmit the virus to other unvaccinated people, this remains in question and further investigation is required. So Adolfo, based on this, it seems that it won't be necessary to use measures of protection and oral mouth rinses after receiving the vaccine. Yeah, I, I disagree, uh, Vanessa, uh, because um, 
uh, vaccination is not a silver bullet. Um, vaccination to reach herd immunity will take a long way. Actually, we are vaccinating 7 million people in the world each day, and the, and the United States is, uh, is the leader in, in that area. Since uh, they are vaccinating 2.5 million people a day. And um, Colombia, for instance, my country, is only vaccinating um, 100,000 people a day. And we have a population of 50 million people. But at this pace, we will need another three or four more years to cover 70% of the population. So, so that still there is a long way to reach that cold herd immunity. In addition, like I just said before, people that is already vaccinated, since the vaccine, they are not 100% effective, still can become infected and also spread the virus. And um, I am worried about the appearance of the most infection variants, like uh, in the one that are uh, showing up in the UK, South Africa and Brazil. Uh, so the whole world will take a while to overcome this problem. Yes, Adolfo. Yes, I agree with you. And regarding the variants, the appearance of at least four or five variants, I mean, the Brazilian one, the English, South African and California, has been described so far. And it's likely that some other will be described later on because this virus is still adapting to the human host. So the, the risk of current vaccines, which are called the first generation vaccines, is they're not being sufficiently effective with all the variants. But let's take this fact to the field of mouthwashes. We can point out that the mechanism of action described for its active ingredients is rather general and not as specific. The CPC, for example, attacks the membrane, which will be practically identical in all variants, and therefore these molecules should be equally effective. And in fact, I'm showing you this slide. It's a study that we have carried out in a collaboration between the Research Center researchers and those of the Irsikasha Age Research Institute. We have shown that the CBC is equally effective against the variant that was circulating in March 2020 in Spain and the English variant. You can see this is P117 is the English variant and this one is the, the Wuhan variant that arrived to Spain last year. So in the graph, we can see how CPC, this is the, the product that we use it with 0.07% of CPC, uh, can reduce the viral low even lower to the limit of detection. And this, this uh, degradation of the virus is observed in one minute of treatment and also in two minutes of treatment. The, the time of exposure. Vanessa, I am... Tell me, yes. Yeah. Vanessa, I am very pleased with this uh, novel and important yes. result. Yes. Yeah, because actually you are you, you are showing that CPC uh, is controlling the, the viral variants. Uh, actually, this is a, a breakthrough. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's a breakthrough. So, um, since vaccination is not the panacea. So uh, public health uh, protection measures uh, to limit the viral spread should be still necessary. Mm -hmm. And uh, to finish this uh, important dialogue, I will summarize this with the measures to take back home. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. So uh, this won't be the last pandemic that will face uh, a humanity uh, probably uh, in the future, there will be several new uh, respiratory viruses um, uh, affecting the population. But um, this one, you know, the, the ongoing one, the SARS-CoV-2, is generating a huge challenge to science, to the health system, to health professionals, and to the economy, and also uh, to uh, the politics. You know, everyone knows that um, there is a relative 
that has lost uh, their lives and uh, people is, uh, is losing their, their jobs and um, still this is a, a tremendous collapse for 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 the for the whole world in addition um, the health professions including dentistry uh, we will need to develop new technologies to cope transmission of SARS-CoV-2 so through via aerosols and fomites uh, population vaccination however is a very important and clever approach to protect the, the population and to reduce both the disease transmission and the disease severity. Uh, the new uh, viral variants uh, is challenging, uh, uh, but, but by fortune we have CPC. And um, the final one is that uh, I really believe that the regular use of mouthwashes could prevent and limit the disease severity. But, however, this hypothesis needs uh, further confirmation of the randomized clinical trials that I already finished or on wrong. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adolfo. Okay. Let's see if we have some questions. Um, the first one, if CPC is so effective, why its use is not extended such as a hand washing and how long does CPC protection last? Well, I think there are some uh, hand washings with CPC. It's a universal molecule that all several uh, ammonium, quaternary ammonium has been used in, in different products, not only in oral care products. It's, you can locate in, in different hygiene products hygiene, humankind hygiene products. And how long does the CPC protection last? Well, the sustainability in the oral cavity ranges from three to five hours. Okay. Uh, I, will, I will like to answer the last one. Okay. Uh, I hope that soap works in a similar way as CPC, but soap can it be used in the mouth, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, it cannot be used in the mouth, but... Um, uh, the toothpastes also have the same principle. Yeah? The, mod, the, 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 the toothpaste has some detergent action that actually can uh, be useful uh, um, uh, to destroy uh, the viral envelope. And uh, probably um, this is something that we can uh, research, uh, uh, do further research on that area. Okay. So I think that we do not have more questions. So Adolfo, it has been a pleasure to share this presentation with you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to collaborate the research with you. Thank you all of you for being here tonight. And we will see uh, at the next Aula Dentite. Enjoy and be safe and take care of all of you and your family. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.